Um, I, we think about our work at the Research to Policy Collaboration as sort of meta science in that we're thinking about the science of science and how policymakers use research evidence. Um, this work was later also supported by William C. Grant Foundation and National Science Foundation. We're really excited. Um, I'm going to give you guys some preliminary data today and um, we have conducted 50 randomized controlled trials so far on science um, communication strategies. And um, so I'll preview those results. What's to come is we'll also be hoping to investigate the potential impact of disseminating the, these, um, the sciences among policymakers at both state and federal levels. So our goal is um, really being this bridge and broker between research and policy communities. And the focus of today's talk is really emphasizing how we translate research findings. I want to start with a conceptual framework. I stole this cake metaphor <clears throat> from Ann Bowes, who presented on her book, um, Evidence and Policy. Um, she says that as a field, we really started by thinking about how research gets used in terms of how it's disseminated. We need to make our research more accessible, and therefore, people will come. Um, but at the next step of uh, we have learned that relationships are really important and um, interactions can be really critical for helping to make sense out of how to use research and its implications. Um, and that's because uh, policy moves fast and we need to be responsive and be providing uh, relevant research at the right time. And collaboration may really have an um, opportunity for us to support these interactions, but also understand how we can be timely and relevant in sciences. And the top layer is the icing of the cake, right? It kind of holds everything together. And that's where we really want to go is how we think about how um, our institutions can be supporting the transfer of knowledge from its generation into actual, actual um, use by by decision makers of all types. And that's not just policymakers, but practitioners as well. Um, so a little bit more about who we are. The Research to Policy Collaboration facilitates partnerships between research and congressional offices. We have um, been working to adapt this at the state level as well, so legislative offices in general. Uh, we start by understanding what policymakers' needs are, and then we identify researchers who have related experiences, and we broker their engagement. We view the bridge as really bi-directional in that um, not only are we hoping that policymakers might use research evidence that we've generated, but policymakers can also inform us, too, in how we communicate science and be timely and relevant or the kind of questions that policymakers have. So we anticipate by facilitating interactions, we can have a bi-directional information flow. Um, so if our core work really started around this interaction component, facilitating research or policymaking communications, um, as you might imagine, COVID uh, sort of forced everyone to reconcile their you know, day to day activities and how that works in a digital space. And so the Huck Institute's allowed us to think about how we do a virtual adaptation and we started to engage researchers in creating fact sheets that were based on priorities that we had already previously identified in these interactions. And that allowed us to then disseminate the fact sheets that we felt like were going to be relevant to policymakers' interests. And so what we um, have found also is that dissemination might also support or increase our likelihood of engaging with offices. This has all been virtual, of course. We've held meetings. In fact, um, we've re received as a result of this dissemination process, 74 requests from legislative offices in state and federal offices. Um, that includes consultations that have occurred 38 times and um, a number of meetings where we could um, continue to build capacity at the state level um, to further our potential impact. The theoretical feedback loop, of course, and, um, is that it's sort of this bi-directional thing. So um, we have also experienced that um, descriptively, there's been some, some success in reaching legislators. Oh, over 100,000 opened emails 
um, and that's across trials. I spent 50 trials earlier. And um, our sample includes uh, these state legislators as well as state and federal legislative staff. 3,000, about 4,000 state legislators and 5,000 state and federal staff. So we realized that um, decision making would be really fast paced um, because of the crisis and we wanted to find ways to be supportive and provide timely evidence. Um, because there's not like an evidence-based practice to addressing a novel virus, we needed to draw upon what was best available knowledge. I think some of um, the theoretical frameworks that um, Greg and Mark presented, helping them to think about their own research, it helps us also think about well, what might be going on in the way of um, the intersection between social issues and um, the current Current dilemmas caused by social isolation or um, shutdowns and things like that. So uh, we also recognized that inequities were compounded and wanted to find ways to address um, the information gap there on how the effects of the virus were being disproportionately felt. Um, and so we um, sought to improve science communication and um, Using the fact sheets, we targeted legislative audience. Fact sheets are about one to two pages. They're very concise um, with only one real key point and lots of embedded resources and links to find more information. Um, this was intended to increase the reach of research. Of course, there's other parts of the theoretical model as to whether or not people understand it and use it, which we um, can explore in uh, future studies. The, so we deployed uh, rapid cycle A-B messaging trials, which really means that every time we tested something, it informed what we wanted to test again. Because language is complex, it's really hard to make a decision as, or it's hard to determine, is this message being opened more because of A or B? Or what if we reframe it and test that same theory again in different ways? And so replication has been very important for us to deepen our understanding. We're drawing theories from social psychology, such as persuasion tactics, um, use of research evidence theory, including how do we improve our perceived relevance. And um, the, these types of tactics have been um, also explored with primarily with advertising marketing um, research, but how can we use that for social good in the science of science? Um, we've used negative binomial regressions to assess how often the email was opened. And so my next slides, I'm going to um, provide you with some overviews of the earliest findings that are sort of in a snapshot just to sort of thematically group some of what we're starting to see. Um, the asterisks will indicate uh, significantly better open rates unless a click rate is noted. Uh, most of our trials to date have manipulated the subject line with the intent of affecting open rates. So therefore we don't actually expect to see a lot of difference on the click rate yet in the study, in the stage of our study. Just to note the difference here, open rate is really about, did they open the email based on the subject line? Whereas click rate is once they're in the email, did they open the fact sheet itself? So first we wanted to think about all right, well, what if we personalize subject lines? And personalization for policymakers can look and feel in different ways. We can say their name, we can say their state, we can say their district. And so we have um, the three trials that we're providing results here. In trial one, we really were thinking more globalization. Is a global perspective versus an American perspective versus a state perspective going to be most op open? Um, and what we found was that uh, the state was more successful and the same was true in a second trial where we replicated. And in fact, we also found that the name was uh, successfully more likely to be opened as well. Um, now, you'll also note that the, um, the name of the legislator and the name of the state are earlier in placement in these subject lines, whereas in, third, in the third trial, we did not have a significant finding, but what was noteworthy about this contextually is that we had a very high open rate for police community relations. Overall, it was much larger open rate than what we usually see 
And so our ability to detect change means he's muted. So Taylor, we're at five minutes. Okay. So let me fly through this a little bit just to kind of give you more snapshots. So classic persuasion theories from social science, we've um, overwhelmingly found that persuasion tactics have not worked with this population. And what we're thinking is that um, it may trigger some perception of insider um, versus outsider bias, where if it's an advocacy organization that may be um, trying to manipulate policymakers, they may be more likely to click and open things that are more neutral. Uh, this allowed us to shift from a, um, a newsletter format to a grassroots format. This whole theory um, also informed us testing, okay, well, what if we don't move away from this really advanced newsletter format and found that they were opening the plain email rate um, 24 times more. And when we moved to a completely grassroots format, which you can see is just like, you know, I'm a researcher, I sent you this thing, had 26 times um, more clicks than the newsletter. So it definitely informed how we approach this going forward. We've also tested messages on inequality where we found that, um, that problem frames and things that potentially elicit more emotion may be uh, performing better and being open more often. Um, and that includes things like uh, we have found that social disparities was performing, um, it was, was opened more often than more neutral, uh, more neutral frames. Uh, we had some mixed findings here as well in, the, in a second trial. We didn't actually see inequities, but again, you see how this is placed, the manipulation is placed at the end of the subject line. And so we need to better understand if uh, we're diluting our effect by uh, the placement of the manipulation. Um, whereas we saw the words oppression um, perform better than some of these other frames, and perhaps that's even just more widely recognized and understood and emotionally triggering is oppression as opposed to a reframe like unequal threats. Uh, we tested again, we saw threats over solutions. And so that allowed us to actually, sorry, I feel like these are a little backwards. We had two subsequent theories after that. We were like, okay, well, maybe it's about emotions. And what we thought we found is that explicitly referencing emotions did not um, have an impact. Um, but we again see that there's more traction on this concerns frame. And um, we found that the um, evidence um, on police reporting was performing better than empathy. So maybe emotions are not actually as potent for this audience. It's important to remember that this is a policymaking audience, so it's not the same as other messaging work that's been done with general population or segments of the population. Um, overwhelmingly, we found that problem frame messages are opened more often, but that come, sorry, I know I'm probably close to time, right? Now. Yeah, yeah. Um, overwhelmingly, we found that problem frame over solution is open more often. And what we're contending with next is, is um, our potential to contribute to constructive messaging is really um, what we see in the literature. Theories suggest that, and other, other studies have found that problem frames might get more eyeballs, such as you know, even mainstream media and sensationalizing um, just to get viewers. But if by harping on the problems, we get more viewers, does that even still mean that we're being constructive in advancing social change? And so we have a lot more to test and unpack here how we can make it a productive message. Um, so we found that, you know, there's some support for relevance and tailoring to the audience. Also, not just tailoring that message, but what are the norms and language and motivations of your audience? In this case, policymakers may be different than the general population. Uh, what we seek to do is build routine evaluation so that this is embedded in our process of dissemination so that we can continue to learn. Um, and that means having uh, capacity to, to, um, to test science communication, which may have implications for organizations that want to engage in dissemination. How do we build capacity as a field to do more of this kind of work? Um, what we want to do in the future is understand its impact on bill language and how legislators comment. So we'll be doing um, coding of uh, use of research evidence in legislative activity. And I think that's it. So thank you guys. Great. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, I want to, yeah, <laughs> so 
can clap on mute um, for all three of our, our presenters. The, again, the, the breadth and the depth of our research and the way that we're covering that translational spectrum is, is really important. I wanna open it up. Um, we have about 10 minutes left uh, in the seminar for questions. And uh, we don't have the raise hand feature available because we're not in a webinar mode. So the way that we're gonna uh, take questions is if you could open the chat and chat to all and just drop your name in, I'll be monitoring that and just sort of calling on, on folks um, as, as we populate that chat box. Um, let's see here, and Vanessa is going to help me as well. So I'm gonna to all. Just put questions here. And then one thing that I observed um, is uh, the through line of relationships and relational quality in all three of the, the presentations. So I just thought that was really, really interesting. Um, I'm just again, uh, looking at the chat, make sure that I have this up if people are dropping their names in for questions. Meg, could I just say something while you're looking for a question? Yeah, I see that you have one here too, yep. Um, I just want to say, um, uh, I don't know about Taylor, but I know for Greg and I and our team, um, for me, Michelle Hostetler and, and Joey Cefeli, um, trying to pivot and mount new data collection in the middle of a new pandemic was incredibly stressful. And um, uh, it, it, we were personally, you know, going through the same thing everybody else was. And then we were um, working really hard on this front as well. And I wanna thank um, everybody who worked on all of this research with us um, for, for going through that. Great, thanks, Mark. And um, you, had a, you had a question, what are the rates and differences of opening for Taylor? Sorry, what are the differences in open rates on yeah, Mark, do you want to restate that question, the rates and different? Yeah, Taylor, you, you told us which ones, you know, were opened more, clicked more. I was just getting wondering for a general sense of what the, the baseline rates were and how big the differences were. Good question. And it varied a bit by sample. So you guys may have noticed we had some of the police um, work woven into that because, you know, 2020 has been complex and multiple <laughs> phenomenon happening that have been relevant to national policy. So we um, strove to adapt to incorporate some of that. So for instance, anything that was related to more of a judicial lens, we had a smaller sample. Um, I will say that for our primary sample, the COVID research has gone out mostly to health related committee staff and legislators. And that has, um, our sample there is about 8,000. And um, once we moved away from the newsletter, because I said 26 times, I mean, it was serious difference. Once we went into this grassroots format, we see the open rates of the actual link are oftentimes um, between 400 and sometimes 800 times. And um, the folks working with us like to say um, that would pack any conference room, right? And so um, I think on the lower end, we've had fact sheets opened a few hundred times. Um, but it's really exciting to just get people's work out there, even if it's just being clicked on for just a second to see the headlines. 